Hello, this is Eastern Europe Review, a joint production of Belsat and TVP World with reports and analysis from Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. I'm Alexandra Shapalina and these are the main stories. Putin visits China, Lukashenko stays in Minsk. Why did Xi Jinping forget about his friend, dictator Lukashenko? Lukashenko is creating artificial problems along the Belt and Road transit route for China, and this is toxic and impractical. War propaganda in Russia reaches kindergartens, impact on four-year-old children. What can you put in your vest? Bullets, food and knives. You can even put a bottle here, and you can put guns here. Hunting tanks and bombing trenches, the grueling reality of Ukrainian drone operators in wartime. Sometimes we need to be in the air all the time, so we take off, fly, land, change the battery and fly on. It can happen that in a day you may not eat, sleep for only 20 minutes. The Belarusian dictator didn't attend the One Belt, One Road forum in Beijing, where 130 state leaders gathered. This decision raises questions, especially since China remains one of the few allies of the almost completely isolated Lukashenko regime. Moreover, considering Belarus' strategic geographical position and its involvement in the One Belt, One Road project, it appears that Lukashenko has positioned himself at the outskirts of the prominent international event. Alexander Lukashenko was absent from the third One Belt, One Road Forum in Beijing. The event gathered the leaders of 130 states and was dedicated to the 10th anniversary of the ambitious initiative. Despite prior announcements of Belarusian participation and China's significance in the Lukashenko regime's foreign policy, his absence raises questions. Has the Belarusian dictator become an unwanted guest? Vladimir Putin is present at the forum in Beijing, and by all criteria of toxicity, he is obviously even more toxic than Lukashenko. In general, Belarus isn't significant enough for world leaders to boycott the forum in Beijing because of Lukashenko. It's just not on that scale. Proposed by China in 2013, the One Belt, One Road project was Xi Jinping's vision to create the world's largest economic zone, connecting both land and sea routes from China to Europe. The initiative aims to integrate the trade infrastructure of the Silk Road economic belt with that of the maritime Silk Road of the 21st century. Due to its advantageous geographical location, Belarus became a participant in the One Belt, One Road project. Lukashenko actively participated in both previous forums in Beijing. China continues to invest in the Big Stone project, located near the Belarusian capital. China continues to invest in Belarusian infrastructure. But this infrastructure operates very sporadically. Recording, recording, recording. And most likely, every time they have to pick up the phone and say, Dear Alexander Rihorovich, what is the problem with custom points on the EU border? Why did you close them? Just because you felt like doing so? Why did you open them today? Did you feel like it? It's just an unreliable economic partner. Indeed, Lukashenko regime's damaged relations with the West, the country's isolation and its aggressive policies towards its neighbors have contributed to the instability of Belarus and its borders. There are other reasons why the connection between China and Belarus could deteriorate. China, for example, openly advocates against the spread of nuclear weapons beyond the borders of nuclear states and may not welcome the placement of Russian tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. Lukashenko decided to place nuclear weapons on the territory of Belarus, which China was also dissatisfied with. Lukashenko has been actively supporting the war against Ukraine, all of it. But above all, the migrant war with the EU and nuclear weapons has led to the fact that China is sending strong messages to Lukashenko. Today, China is most likely considering the construction of its Silk Road without including Belarus.
Lukashenko is creating artificial problems along the Belt and Road transit route for China, and this is toxic and impractical. Therefore, China will, of course, look for options to bypass the territory of Belarus. China will also send signals to Lukashenko to change his policy. Lukashenko's propaganda hasn't focused on his absence in Beijing. Instead, officials abruptly announced Belarus's trade figures with China. According to representatives of the Ministry of Agriculture and Food, Belarus has traded $6 billion worth of goods with China and sold $2 billion in products to China. The export of potash fertilizers, meat and dairy products to China has doubled. It's as if the officials were implying that nothing unusual is happening and that China continues to be a close friend and ally. Russian kindergartens are beginning to establish museums devoted to the war with Ukraine. One of the first ones is located far from the capital, in the Russian Far East. Children are being taught that Russia's aggression against Ukraine is the defense of their motherland. Additionally, they are learning about how to become military officers. It is possible that this initiative will soon be expanded to other regions in the country. We are in the far east of Russia, more than 6,000 kilometers from Moscow. While the country's capital is still asleep, it's early morning here. In the village of Sosnovka, Habarovsky Krai, children from a local kindergarten are marching information to a special room. Teachers, with the assistance of officers from a nearby military unit, have established a museum, which is dedicated to the so-called special operation announced by Vladimir Putin. Adults are telling the children that the conflict in Ukraine is a national and righteous cause. The military operation zone is very far from our region. Here it's marked in red on our map. Remember, we talked to you that the whole country has united to help our fighters do their job. Teachers explain to the children that war and patriotism are closely related concepts. They emphasize that serving in the army is considered by many as a way to show love for one's country. All classes are conducted in full compliance with the new state concept of Russian education. We are at the very first stage of preschool education and we're already starting to talk about being citizens of our country and what we can do for it, what the country does for us. We engage children in activities like drawing, we participate in competitions and celebrate holidays such as the 9th of May, the Day of National Unity. We discuss all of this with the children as it aligns with our educational program, which we have to follow. Members of the military are invited to join the program to make it more convincing. Dressed in camouflage, they showcase various pieces of military equipment, and even the children get the opportunity to try on these uniforms during these lessons of courage. Kindergartners are truly thrilled by the experience. What can you put in your vest? Bullets, food and knives. You can even put a bottle here. And you can put guns here. Teachers and military personnel do not discuss with the children that prosthetics and medicines are of greater urgency for those affected by the conflict in Ukraine, including contractors and mercenaries. Many times it's impossible to receive the promised support from the state. As a result, special centers have been established in various regions of Russia to address these issues. It is where families of the military members often seek assistance to resolve their problems. It's not only for servicemen, but relatives of the guys who are at war with Ukraine come here too. It's because many guys are still there. Why do they come here? They have questions about mobilization or assignments. They ask about benefits they're entitled to. Saratov, a city with a population of nearly one million in the southeast of European Russia, is hosting high-ranking guests from Moscow who are being shown around a support center for those involved in the conflict funded by the state budget. During their visit, the guests, including senators from Moscow, are sharing insights from their discussions with participants of the war and are discussing certain aspects of Russian legislation. At some point you have to drink with them too. 
It's war and they keep losing friends. My nephew lost his arm near Svatova. When you let this pain wash over you, you realize what things still need to be improved, what laws and regulations need to be in place. In September, the Russian government allocated over $50 million to the Defenders of the Fatherland Foundation for the establishment of support centers for military veterans. Over the past year and a half, Vladimir Putin's regime has allocated approximately $170 billion for the war in Ukraine. Meanwhile, the projected healthcare spending in Russia for the upcoming year is just over $16 billion. In the Avdivka area of the Donetsk region, Ukrainian military units are closely monitoring the flanks of the Russian troops' offensive. The soldiers are effectively preventing enemy forces from advancing through the use of aerial reconnaissance and their own projectile developments. Notably, the fighters in this regiment have recently transitioned from Soviet ammunition to Western land lease supplies. <laughs> We need to set fire to these bastards' dugouts. The flammable mixture burns at a temperature of 1,000 degrees Celsius, sets fire to ammunition and any building materials that are inside the dugout. Wood, plastic, it sets everything on fire. This is a simple disposable setup because the drone is also disposable. Soldiers of the Mariupol Battalion of the 109th Defense Brigade of the Ukrainian Armed Forces are preparing to send a kamikaze drone. In modern warfare, the advantage on the battlefield goes to those on whose side there is more technology and know-how. In fact, the know-how now is homemade ammunition, cans with plastic, with damaging elements such as buckshot, shot and so on, incendiary ammunition that burns at temperatures ranging from 1000 to 1500 degrees. This is also know-how, and this is what is needed now. In the past, Bob worked as an IT specialist, and some skills from his life during the time of peace have helped him understand his new profession. He says the enemy has already learned how to counter small suspended projectiles that are carried by drones. But now the Ukrainian military has ammunition from Western partners. Bob says that they are more powerful. They began to make ceilings on the trenches and stretch the nets. So now we need something more powerful. We will have it and we will use it. You see, for example, these have already been improved. This is from the American MK-19 grenade launcher. That's an accumulative part here. If it falls on a ceiling, it will break through. This week, the Mariupol battalion is opposing one of the flanks of the Russian army's offensive in the Avdivka area. The Russians are advancing past us. Our assistance consists in identifying enemy columns and indicating targets for our artillery. Meanwhile, the fighter with a call sign Karas is ready for takeoff. His kamikaze drone is gaining altitude. This soldier has been transferred to the air service from the infantry and already has thousands of hours of flight time and combat missions. Every day I complete 20 flights, sometimes more than 50. There are many sorties, depending on the situation at the front. Sometimes we need to be in the air all the time, so we take off, fly, land, change the battery and fly on. It can happen that in a day you may not eat, sleep for only 20 minutes and you have to be in the air the entire time. I hold a record. I hit the trench from a height of 300 meters, a thousand feet. Two Russian soldiers were killed, one wounded and the dugout was burned. The intensification of Russian soldiers' actions in the Avdivka area forces Ukrainian aerial reconnaissance operators to spend more time in the sky, closely monitoring the movement of enemy troops. At the same time, these soldiers have to attend to their regular tasks, such as searching for dugouts and target Russian armored vehicles using kamikaze drones. That's all for today. Thank you for watching Eastern Europe Review. We will be back next week with the news stories. I'm Alexandra Shapalina. Keep watching TVP World and see you next time.